interpreting. All right. So the other day, I we reviewed the idea of complex numbers, right? And basically, complex numbers, it's, it's really not a hard concept. It's to say that you guys are familiar with the real number line. You've known that for a while. Well, there's another number line that's orthogonal to it, which is the imaginary number line. And we create what we call the complex plane, okay? Which we're gonna get into in a second. But the fundamental theorem of algebra says that for every polynomial that exists, there's a number of roots for that polynomial that's equal to the order of that polynomial. All right, so if I said x squared plus one equals zero, right? x squared plus one equals zero, what is x? Yeah, x is, yeah, plus or minus the square root of minus one. And we call the square root of minus one is the imaginary number i, which we don't use in electrical computer engineering stuff because that gets confusing with electric current. So we call it the imaginary number j, all right? And, and really what it comes down to, I introduced this idea a little bit. Imaginary numbers, yeah, are they imaginary? I guess, right? But if, if it's a stupid term in a way, it, when I get into to numbers like, let's say I have three plus four J, what that ultimately, that complex piece represents is that I can, I have a sine wave that has a magnitude and a phase. It allows me to track the two important parameters of a sine wave together in one number. And when I'm doing stuff in signal processing or in circuits, that turns out to be a really useful way that basically turns two equations into one, all right? So that's that's the kind of stuff that we'll we'll kind of talk about a little bit more as we go through the next couple of lectures. All right. So we, we got those definitions. All right. So last time, all right, we introduced basically the fact that there were three different forms of a complex number. All right. There's the rectangular form or Cartesian form. All right. Now, what I have is what I call the complex plane. So this here is what I call the complex plane. All the complex plane is, is the idea that there's the real number line and then orthogonal to it, or so perpendicular to it, is the, the imaginary line, all right? Again, comes really useful when we talk, start thinking about using this concept to represent sinusoids, all right? So in this case, my vector name is R, all right? That's what I refer to it. My vector is R. So what I tried to do here is represent all the important stuff about R. Right, so if R equals A plus JB, then A is the is this length right here, and B is this length right here. Okay, so that tells you that A, B, and the magnitude of that vector form a triangle, right? And then I can use trigonometry to get the relationships between the real part and the imaginary part and the magnitude, right? So it's Pythagorean theorem and and geometry. Or trigonometry, sorry. All right. There were, what we introduced essentially was this Cartesian form, right? Which is to say, I can express this thing in terms of real and imaginary parts. I say Cartesian, I give the example of, like when you were in physics, you would say, well, I had a, I have a vector, you know, a velocity vector, right? That could be three X hat plus four Y hat, right? You called X hat and Y hat unit vectors, right? This case is the same thing, right? If I said I have three plus four J, I have a vector that points in the X direction, three units, and the Y direction, four units. It just, there's no unit vector here on that three, but there is a unit vector on the four, okay? The Y component always has that unit vector. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a hard concept, but it's just a little bit different than, than what you're used to, right? So polar is the other unit system that I can use for this or coordinate system, which is to say, if I have a vector that I have X, Y coordinates to, I can express that vector with a magnitude and an angle. Now, the thing that I ended up with last time, as I said, this also relates to something called the complex exponential. All right. And in that, so I'm going to flip back to that slide here in a second, but I wanted to just go to this. This is where we kind of ended last time. So this notion of this thing I call Euler's identity. Euler's identity was to say, if I have e to the j phi, e, or really e to the j x, e to the j x is equal to cosine of x 
plus j sine x. Most of you will never care about how that's derived. If you want to see it, you can go into the book, chapter four, it's there. But basically, you put in here the power series for e to the x. And then you can see that this guy here is the power series of cosine x. And this is the power series of sine x. You can do that derivation. All right. Somehow Euler figured that out. Don't know how, but he did it. All right. Um, and we use it all the time. All right. And and the reason for that is, as we said the other day, math with exponentials, particularly mul multiplication with and division with exponentials is easy. Right. If I have e to the a times e to the b, what is that equal to? Yeah, e to the a plus b. If I have e to the a divided by e to the b, what is that? E to the a minus b. All right. So that, that's going to become pretty useful to me later on. Okay. All right. So going back to our summary of stuff from last time, we basically said, all right, there's a set of formulas. Though if I know the real and imaginary part, so term the term that I used here, this a Okay, that's like sort of the x vector component and b is the y vector component. I call a the real part and I call b the imaginary part. jb is not the imaginary part. b is the imaginary part. Okay, all right. <clears throat> um, and then I, they've got a couple of different ways that I can begin to relate these. Now, the tricky thing that we talked about last time is the angle, right? Looking at the vector that I drew over here, if I said, tell me phi, if I, if I gave you numbers for A and B, right, how would I figure out the angle phi? Yeah, it's the arc tan or inverse tan of what over what? B over A. And again, just think about this from a trigonometric perspective. If B is a number, A is a number, it's just trigonometry, all right? It's not too hard to really think about it. All right, now the the... I have this over here, this sort of complicated thing. Why do I have that for the angle? Why, why this more complicated thing? Inverse tan only is defined in what two quadrants? One and four. Okay, one and four. Doesn't work when I'm in two and three. All right. So I have to put some thought into it in those cases. Okay. All right, um, and then we we talked about Euler's identity. We had two things that we talked about last time too, which is to say that addition and subtraction of complex numbers should be done in rectangular form, okay? So when I'm looking at this, if I have two vectors here, Z1 and Z2, right? I just, if I add them, I add their real parts and I add their imaginary parts. If I subtract them, subtract their real parts, subtract their imaginary parts, all right? Pretty straightforward. Multiplication is done using this complex exponential form, all right? And, and that's just basically because of the fact that the, the exponential, right? I can add exponents when I multiply, I can subtract exponents when I, when I divide. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward stuff. Question is we gotta start trying to use it. Um, all right, so we talked about this relationship. So let's do an example, all right? So, so I got two complex numbers here. Z1 equals minus three plus six J and Z2 equals four minus three J. And I want to compute Z1 divided by Z2. And I want the answer in rectangular format. Now, <clears throat> this is the, you, you could, we're going to do this two ways. We do this the hard way and do this the easy way. Hard way is what you're going to have to do for me on the test, right? So on the test, I would probably give you something like this. And I would say, give me Z3 equals Z1 divided by Z2 and show me, the, show me the answer in a particular format, okay? Now, in your homework, you've got stuff like this too, but you could totally do it the easy way with MATLAB, all right? So we're gonna do the hard way and we do the easy way today, all right? And we're gonna see how much easier the easy way is with MATLAB, okay? All right, so where should I start? This is a division problem, right? So what kind of format should the numbers be in if it's a division problem? The exponential form. Yeah, the Euler's form, exponential. Those are all sort of the same thing. What did I give them to you in? Rectangular. All right, so what's the first thing we got to do? We got to convert them. 
All right, so step one is to convert. So I, I need to figure out here the magnitude of Z1 and the magnitude of Z2. So notice we always write magnitude with those bars like that, right? Hopefully you know that. Um, and I also got to figure out the angle of Z1 and angle of Z2. So I often will write those like this, right? With those With that angle sign. All right, how do I get the magnitude of Z1, given what I've got here. The magnitude of Z1 is what? Yep, square root, yeah, square root of negative three squared plus six squared. Okay, pretty straightforward. Magnitude of Z2, what's that gonna be? Square root of what? Yeah, four squared plus minus three squared. Now notice the J doesn't go in there, right? Lots of people do that. They put the J in there. What happens if I'd put the J in there? J squared has a meaning, right? J squared becomes what? Minus one, all right? J squared is minus one, so don't ever include that. Now we gotta get to the angle, right? So uh, if we want some numbers for those two things, and chances are you probably do, right? This guy is five. And this guy here is 6.7082, like that. How do I get the angles? What should I do to get the angles? Well, yeah, almost right, right? So tan inverse is of, of the imaginary part of the real part. Except I got to think about what quadrant they're in, right? That's, yeah, so let's put, you know, of course, I, I put them hopefully in quadrants that might confuse us a little bit, right? So that's there's... <laughs> Because that's what I'll do on a test. Right? I'm not going to give you the straightforward first quadrant stuff, probably. Um, minus three plus six j. Where's that guy? Yeah, which is coke? Yeah, quadrant two. So that's going to be over three up six. All right, so this is z one. So quadrant two, I already know I got some manipulation to do, right? What about z two? Where's that guy? Four, four minus three, so over four down three, so this is Z2. Now I usually, I'm not that careful about necessarily drawing them, but I, I, I do wanna make sure that I draw them out so I know what, what quadrants they're in, right? Mm -hmm. So, all right, so let's start with Z2. The angle of Z2, go ahead. What's that guy gonna be? Give me the formula for that. Yep, yeah, regular tan inverse. So tan inverse of because because tan inverse is defined just fine in the first quadrant, fourth quadrant, right? So this guy becomes negative three divided by four. And if I do that math, I end up with negative 36.87 degrees. Okay. All right. Now, what about the angle of Z1? Yeah, so so what I said the other day is I you know I can really I get the same answer if, if I add or subtract 180. I, and I say be careful. I get sort of the same answer, right? I don't get exactly the same answer. And the reason I say I don't get exactly the same answer is because um, I'll get one of them is going to be a positive angle, one of them is going to be a negative angle. Okay, they 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 point to the same place, but one's positive, one's negative. All right, so. All right, what would I do here? So arc tan of what over what? What's what's the operation there for Z2? Oh, sorry, yeah, Z1. Yeah, for Z1, what is it? Six over negative three, so that would be negative two, right? And then I gotta add or subtract 180 degrees. So if I do that, the two answers that I get here, one of them is 116.57, and the other is negative 243.43 degrees. All right, both the same. Then notice the absolute value of those is always gonna add 360 degrees, right? That's gotta be the case, yeah. It it does. I mean, so 
because of the fact that I can only look for one number in the homework, I, I always say make sure the angle you give is between 180 and minus 180. So it, it wouldn't it wouldn't accept the negative 243. It's correct, and that's that's the kind of stuff that's going to drive you crazy, because you're going to be like, I, you're going to do it ten times, and you're going to think it's right, all right. But and it is, all right. But I can only look for one answer. I can't look for all of them. Okay. Tests are done by hand, so whatever's right is right. I I, I can use my unartificial intelligence to 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 judge that one. All right. All right. So. How would I now, I'm only halfway there. So I've got, I've got the angles of those things. So now what I can say is that Z1 and Z2, if I want, all right, I can say Z1 is, um, what did I say is magnitude? 6.7082 with an angle of 116.57 degrees. Like that. All right, it sounds like you guys are unsheathing your calculator. All right, so what do I got here? So I got a five angle, negative, negative 36.87 degrees. All right, now you can write that with the angle sign too. The polar form, you'd say five angle negative 36.87. I'll, I'll tend to do it more this way because that's this is a, the mathy more class, right? If I'm teaching circuits too, I don't usually deal with the exponential, but it's not that hard to get used to. And you should get used to it. Okay. All right. So I got that. Now what do I do to get Z3 here? This Z1 divided by Z2. I just divide, right? Right. So I'd say Z3 is equal to Z1 divided by Z2. So it becomes 6.7082. Five times e to the j, and I subtract the angles, right? So the angles I had, I had 116.5657, I guess I called it, degrees minus, minus 36. So minus, minus 36. So that's plus 36.87 degrees. All right, and that guy's going to work out to be, uh, if I ch if I go through that math, one point three four one six, and his angle is going to be one hundred and fifty three point four four degrees. All right, that'll be our final result. Okay, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So the rectangular format is it the one that's like the Rect a, e, j, yeah. Rectangular format is like what I have for Z1 and Z2 right there. And this one is this is a complex exponential form. Okay. Now in MATLAB, what so when you submit your homework, what I'll probably if I ask you for it in rectangular form, I'll tell you to give me the real part and the imaginary part. Yeah, yeah. If 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 I ask for it in complex exponential form, I'll tell you to give me the magnitude and the angle. Okay. Now, here's a question. So I've only I've if you if you did this on a test, if I had this on a test, you'd get partial credit at this point, All right? Why wouldn't you get full credit? I asked for rectangular form. All right. So how do I get this to rectangular form once I'm here? Yeah. So how how do I? What's the what's the tool? Yeah, that, that whole thing here with that Euler's identity thing, right? So R is A plus JB, and that works out to be this whole thing, okay? So I say this is Z3 equals 1.3416 cosine of... Phi, right? I'm going to call this phi. I don't want to write the whole thing out here for a second. All right. Plus J 1.3416 sine phi. All right. <clears throat> and that'll work out to be, if you do the math, that becomes negative 1.2 plus J times 0 0.6. 
like that. All right. Now, that's the long way, right? It's a long way I use the formulas, right? Turns out in MATLAB, what I could have done, I'll skip ahead here. To, I'm going to go through MATLAB here slowly. But the short way, I could have done this. Z3 equals Z1 divided by Z2. Yeah. You, you've learned. You've learned. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Now that's that said, I mean, you know, I you know, had you just used your calculator, that's what you would have done. And you're gonna need to know that. So in other words, expect Yahoo on, on a 2112 test to to in 2112, I think you still got you using your calculator at TI 31 or whatever, right? Um, and so you're gonna need to do that probably. So it's and, and you should know how to do it the, the right way. All right, but that would work. And if I wanted to know the real part and the imaginary part, and I got a summary of the commands here that we're going to go through, but if I wanted to know the real part and the imaginary part, I just say real and imag. All right. And it'll tell me the real part and the imaginary part of that number. All right. One thing that I, I don't ever like doing is what I'm about to show you, right? Which is where if I say what I have here, so clear, so here's 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 a couple of ways to do this in MATLAB. Right. So clear all. Z1 is that negative three plus six J and our J is just defined to be the complex number J or imaginary number. Z2 is four minus three J. Okay. Then what I did is I got a couple of different commands here. So the, the one I say to never do is the one that we taught you, right? Why, why, why don't I like this? It's messy. Yes. It's also hard coded, right? In other words, if if I you know I'm gonna have I'm gonna have something for Z1 mag I'm gonna have something for Z1 angle and one of them I might put a minus three and one of them I might put a three I'd rather just define once what Z1 is and then and then have it as a variable so it's soft sort of soft coded in there not hard coded all right again as a, as as a computer engineer you should be thinking about that all the time I want to I want to not hard code values because then you're gonna errors are gonna propagate on you yes sir. Yeah, so 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 I've got here a summary we're going to talk about here in a second. There's there's basically there's a set of MATLAB commands that we're going to try to use. All right. Um, <clears throat> for now, let's just focus on like this Z. What this is? Okay, Z one mag. That's the way. That's the way this guy did it when he did his homework. Right. He sat down and he did that. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you did it on your calculator and put the number, pasted the number into MATLAB. Right. And I've seen lots of people do that where I, they show me during office hours, they show me their answers and it just says Z1 mag equals 3.6246 or whatever. Right. They've done it on their calculator and put it in there by hand. Right. Get, get used to calling, doing it in MATLAB. One thing I said, too, is on this. This is a similar question to what I might have on the test. Right. You will have MATLAB with you so you could do what I just did and do Z3 equals Z1 divided by Z2. And you'll know you're right. Okay. In my mind, that's not cheating, right? And I've just recorded, and I'm going to put that on YouTube saying that's not cheating. I'm going to expect you to show me the steps, but if I've got the computer there, I might as well verify that my answer is right, right? I would expect you to do that. My hope would be that everybody would get it right, all right? That's, that would be my hope, is that you know how to do it, all right? Now, hopefully that doesn't mean you see the right answer here, and then you try to back force in the calculations. I can, my, my non-artificial intelligence can see that, too, <laughs> if you're just trying to force it, all right? <clears throat> to get the angle, notice what I did here. So I, I've got the, in MATLAB, it's the A tan function, all right? Now I did this a couple of different ways. So I added 180, right? Um, and I, and I, the important thing that I did here is this, 180 divided by pi. Why did I do that? Radians to degrees. Right, radians to degrees. Now the other function that exists is the angle function. The angle function just takes the complex number, and and basically just gives me uh, the angle directly without me having to think about what quadrant it's in. All right, so we'll look at it again a summary of those commands here in a minute. All right, so to 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 get the answer, what I did Z three mag, I took the magnitude of Z one divided by the magnitude of Z2, 
took the angle of Z1, subtracted it from the angle of Z2. All right, that, and then basically what I did was I, I had this Z3 real, Z3 imaginary, and I, I manipulated it, right? So I said the magnitude times cosine, magnitude times sine. Now, let's, before we get too deep into this, let's let's summarize all the MATLAB commands that I've just kind of gone through here, because there's a whole bunch of them, right? So here I'm saying, you know, R, so that the magnitude is A squared plus B squared square root. In MATLAB, that's the abs command, all right? Or absolute value, all right? If I'm talking about the real part, of a complex number, it's real of the complex number. It's the imaginary part, it's the imaginary part of that number, okay? Now, <clears throat> if I'm talking about the angle of it, right, that angle which I defined, which is in terms of arctan, that can be done with either angle or phase. And, and someone asked that question the other day. There used to be a difference. I went back to my notes from 2020 and there was a difference then. Uh, MATLAB's updated it. Angle and phase should basically give you the same result. All right. Um, talk, I'm going to come back to conjugates, right? I didn't really talk about those the other day. Um, to put numbers into MATLAB, right? So I gave this example. So this, this guy here, 10 angle pi over 6. Now it should be clear when I'm saying pi over 6, that's radians and not degrees. All right. I haven't specified, but we know we got pi's. That's probably radians. So how do I put that into MATLAB, right? With the angle. If I want to get that as a complex number in MATLAB, this is how you do it. 10 times exponential J times pi over six. That will now be a complex number. If I enter that into MATLAB, what I'll, what I'll see come back from it will be a real plus J imaginary. MATLAB will always display stuff in, in rectangular form. All right, but you can enter it. If you have an angle and a magnitude, you can enter it using that exponential function. Now, important thing, um, and then, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want. You can, you basically, once a complex number is in there, MATLAB treats a complex number like a real number. It does, it just multiplies it, divides it, treats it like a real number as it should. The important thing here, MATLAB uses the mathematical standard definitions of everything, which means that they are in radians. All trig functions, of which the exponential is also a trig function. All right, Exponential is also a trig function. So notice here, I did j times pi over 6. The exponential is a trig function. If I give it an angle in radians, it, it's an angle in radians. Right? Um, there are two other useful functions here, rad to degrees, degrees to rad. All right, those those do that 180 over pi and pi over 180 that I just always do myself. Okay. Now I don't like to conf I don't like to talk about this, but I'll mention it real quick. There is in MATLAB an, another set of commands that you can use, which is to say I can use sine d, cosine d, tan d. I can take any of the trig functions and add a d after it. What do you think adding a D after it does? Degrees. It will expect things to be in degrees. The one thing that doesn't, one trig function that doesn't have that is exponential. All right, there's no X B. All right. So um, you can do it either way. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just kind of get comfortable saying, okay, MATLAB expects everything in, in radians and I should just keep my angles in degrees and convert to, to radians whenever I need to do a trick operation. Okay. So there's no there's no mode like you had on your calculator in that in that sense. Yeah. More efficient to convert from degrees to radians. Would it be the command or is it just part of the 180 over pi? Um it it's whatever you're more comfortable with, yeah. I mean for for me I because I'm old, I just think of it as 180 over pi, right, or whatever. Sine d, cosine d. I don't, I don't like these functions, and, I, and the reason I, I don't is it's just, it's just confusing to me. Um, I mean, I, I know that you know by definition, if I'm plotting, you know, sine omega t. When I talk about sine waves, it's always omega t, and so I know that's that's in radians. I, I like to think that way. 
Okay. All right. For me, that's, that's an easier process. Okay. All right. Now, the other thing I introduced here was, was conjugates. I didn't talk about this the other day. It's a really simple concept um, and it's important for a lot of stuff. If I have the vector R, that's what I have here. The guy I have down here, his mirror image is what I call R conjugate, okay? R conjugate is where I take the imaginary part and flip it, All right? So that's gonna rotate that guy across the axis here. That means his angle is the opposite angle, okay? Now that's, that's a useful operation in a lot of cases to have. Um, if I need to take the conjugate in MATLAB, it's C-O-N-J, gives me the conjugate. All right, it basically just spits it right out for me. All right, all the commands that you would need in MATLAB are basically here. All right, so you can go back through that in the, in the notes slowly and, and review those commands as you start doing your homework. All right, okay, all right. Let's do another example. Got this guy here, z equals one plus two j to the eighth power. How could I put that in a MATLAB? I could write one plus two j and raise it to the eighth power. And that would give me the right answer. MATLAB treats all numbers like they're, treats all complex numbers just like they're real numbers, so I could totally do that. All right, test, you wouldn't be able to do it. So how should I do that calculation? What form do you think I should use? Rectangular form. What's that? Yeah, exponential would be good, right? Because if I said, let's say I had e to the a, and I raised that to the eighth power. What's e to the a raised to the eighth power? E to the eight a, right? So in this case, I can convert this guy into the magnitude of z. times e to the j angle of z and raise that all to the eighth power, right? What's that become? How would I how would I distribute that eight through there? The z, the magnitude to the eighth power, right? Times e to the j eight angle z. Right? It's a nice straightforward way to try to try to deal with that. All right. So in this case, if I wanted to go through that, this isn't too hard, right? The, the magnitude of this thing, the magnitude of Z, all right, I won't walk through it, but it's basically 2.2361 2 all right? And the angle of this character is 63.44 degrees. 60, what is it, 63.4. Yeah, 63.43 degrees. Not that the not that a point zero one degree matters that much. Okay. All right. So if I were to compute this whole thing here, right? I, I would just plug in those values. What I end up with is um the magnitude of this guy is six hundred and twenty-five, basically. And the angle, eight times sixty-three is what it. Or eight, eight times sixty-three point four three. This guy works out to be five hundred and seven point four four degrees. Okay. So if I asked you to put that in in your homework, I said, well, what's the angle and what's the magnitude of that guy? Magnitude would be fine. You say six twenty-five, you'd be right. If you put in five hundred and seven point four four, you'd probably be wrong. All right, because what, what, what did I say I asked for the angles in? What range typically? 180 to minus 180. Now, I might change that up from time to time just to see if you're paying attention. All right. Usually plus minus one. It, and it, it will always say what it is in, this, in the question. Whether If it doesn't, immediately let me know that, but it should. <laughs> right? So from time to time, I'll throw you off and I'll say, well, give me, give me between zero and 360. All right. And I do that just to see if you're paying attention. Yeah. But if it, if this was between this, if I said give me the answer to 180 and minus 180, this would be wrong. So how would I convert that to something between 180 and minus 180? 
Yeah. So, so yeah. I, so what I did was I said 360 minus 507.44. Right. And that will end up giving me in this case, 147. Let me say approximately 147. There's some, all right. There's some digits missing there. Um, well, I can do 360 minus that. I, I could do that number minus 360. Both of them are going to be correct, right? So there's, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Well, if it's higher than one, let's say it was 200, right? Two, 200 would basically be minus 160, right? So, so it's 360 minus the angle. If you're confused, just draw out, draw out the, draw it out, and then you can always kind of tell from drawing it out, right? I it's one of those things that don't don't bother. There's there's only so many formulas that you should put into your head. Yeah. All right. All right. <clears throat> so complex numbers, for the most part, pretty straightforward stuff. All right. It's not not that hard. Um, one of the, one of the things we need to do is get into why they're useful. That's what we're going to start with doing here today. We're going to talk more about that. Um, basically until next Friday, all right? So looking at this thing, all right, the relationship I have from Euler's identity, e to the j theta equals cosine theta plus j sine theta, all right? If I were to plug into that a negative theta, so if I said, you know, e to the j negative theta, I would plug that negative value into these, right? If I had the cosine, what's so I said the cosine of negative theta. Cosine of negative theta is equal to what? Cosine of theta, right? So the the if there's a negative sign, so in other words, if I had cosine of uh, negative two, that's equal to the cosine of two, right? If I had the sine of negative two, it's equal to the negative sine of two. Right, so e to the negative j theta is this guy. Okay, now, other than the fact that that's just a fact and it's not that useful, it's not that useful, I guess. Um, what if I, but what I, what I want to do is I can actually make some relationships. We're going to make some sense of these relationships, probably a little bit more so on Friday, but I want to kind of derive them out first. Right, let's say I took e to the j theta and I added to it e to the negative j theta, All right? So I add those two things together. e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta becomes what? Yeah, it's gonna become two cosine theta. I'm just basically, I would add these two results together. It'd be two cosine theta. And then what about the sine parts? They're gonna be gone. Right, there's going to be a plus j sine minus j sine. So this guy basically, again, not not a sort of a weird result here at first, but it basically says one half e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta is equal to cosine of theta. All right, again, doesn't strike me as a particularly useful, meaningful result in any kind of way. But it actually does. What it actually says is that the cosine function, the cosine wave, is made up of two vectors that rotate in opposite directions in the complex plane. All right, that actually turns out to be a really useful thing for everything you do in signal processing. All right, so we're going to use that. We're going to use that a lot later. Uh, I could do another thing and show this, and I'm not going to do derivations. Nobody likes derivations. You can see it in the book if you want. Basically, sine of theta is equal to that guy. All right. I said nobody likes derivations. That stuff's ugly anyway, right? Getting you to look at that is about as much as I can probably really do. All right. So, so there's that, those two expressions. Now, we're going to use that a lot. All right. Um, and there's a summary of it here in the notes. I want to use that to express this cosine wave. All right. So I, I just what I just wrote out was that cosine of theta equals one half e to the j theta 
plus one yeah. half e to the minus j theta. Like that. All right. And I also wrote out, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do my harder one first, right? And we're going to come back to the easier one. And I have a reason for that. Um, sine of theta, I said, was 1 over 2j. And, and there ain't no reason in the world to memorize these formulas. Okay. Like that. I want to use that to represent this waveform. Okay. Now to do that, this is this is kind of close. This guy looks like 10 sine of theta to me, doesn't it? What's theta? 30t plus 10 degrees. All right. So that means I can write this guy as how can how can I how can I use this formula here to expand that? Yeah, take ten times all of that, right? So I'd say ten um, over two j e to the j theta minus ten over two j e to the minus j theta, like that. Okay. Now, in in your homework, you got a thing. Where again, I'm going to put some more meaning, physical meaning to this stuff here in a second. But you have a thing where, where basically I I say, if I let me give me a second, let me let me break this down. I'll relate it to your homework here. Ten over two j e to the j theta. Let me plug in what theta is. All right, if theta is thirty t plus ten degrees, isn't this also e to the j ten degrees times e to the j thirty t? Right. And this guy, minus 10 over 2j times e to the negative j 10 degrees times e to the negative j 30t. This is just like what you have, the very last problem on the homework. This guy is my a1. This guy is my a2. In other words, in the homework, I say, all right, you have this x of t is equal to a1 e to the j 30t plus a2 e to the minus j 30t. All right, now, what I want you to help me with, so let's, let's <clears throat> this a1, a1, oops, oops, is, this is why I wanted to jump to this one, because I, I wanted to try to manipulate this complex number and get it to one complex number. All right, 10 over 2j, e to the j 10 degrees. I want to get that to one complex number. I want to get one magnitude and one angle. All right. So how do I do that? If I'm if I'm dividing, so, so I've got a division problem here, right? I'm dividing complex numbers. Right? Uh, what format do I want to use for division? Exponential. All right. The the top guy is already an exponential, right? 10 times e to the j 10 degrees, already in complex exponential form. What about the bottom, 2j? It's in rectangular. So you can go to your formulas. Your formulas are going to cause you problems. Why? What's that? Well, I'm dividing, I got an exponential divided by a rectangular. 2, 2j, what's the angle of 2j? What is it? 90. Yeah, 90. He points straight up, right? He's got no real part, but he points straight up. So this guy is actually really easy to convert. I can say this guy is 2 with an angle of 90 degrees. Now, some of you are going to go into, and you're going to say arctan of, what's going to be arctan of imaginary? 2 over real, which is 0, undefined. All right, so you're going to sit there for an hour not getting stuff right, but you got to think about that one, right? That Now, if you asked MATLAB angle of 2J, it would say 90 degrees. All right, if you did the arctan function, you'd be sitting there for a while because arctan won't be defined. All right, so that's an important thing. What did I do? Okay. 
All right. So this works out to be a pretty easy problem, right? It works out to be five e to the j 10 degrees minus 90. So that becomes minus 80 degrees. All right. Now, real quick, I got one minute. I'm going to try to do the other one. A2 equals negative 10 over 2j times e to the negative j 10 degrees. All right. Now, in this case, 2j we already know. What's 2j? We said that's 2 with an angle of 90 degrees. On the top, what do I have? I have minus 10 times e to the negative j 10 degrees. What's the angle of that? What's, well, yeah, so what's what's the angle of negative 10? Negative 10 is a complex number, right? So if I said I had negative 10, I can write that in complex exponential form. What's the mag, this screws up a lot of people. What's the magnitude of negative 10? 10. What's the angle of negative 10? Not 90 degrees, 180, or minus 180. That would work too. All right? Why 180? Where's it? Where's he points on the negative real axis, right? And if you if you were to draw that, he'd be on the negative real axis. So that says that up top here, I got 10 e to the j 180 degrees times e to the negative j 10 degrees over 2 e to the j 90 degrees. All right. So then what do you got to do? I got to say 180 minus 10 minus 90, right? And this guy should work out to be 5 e to the j 80 degrees by the time I'm done. Those two numbers, a1 and a2, are conjugates of each other, that thing that I defined, all right? That, that conjugate thing ends up being a useful quantity, okay? All right. So...